Alrighty, welcome to the 97th edition of Before the Battle here live on YouTube. My name is Nick Baldwin. Joining me as always is a writer for MMAfighting.com. It is Jed Mashu. Jed, how's it going? I'm doing well, Nick. How are you? I'm not too bad. I uh, cannot complain. Exams are coming up, so that means I ha had today off, I have tomorrow off, I have almost all the next week off, so again, can't gonna, complain too much. Look at that, that's nice. And more more importantly, Nick, you didn't mention who's not here, which was once again... I, I was getting to that. The first card of the year, he wasn't here. Is that right? He missed the first card yeah. of the year? And then he came back, he said he was going to be here a lot. He said it wasn't going to be another three-month stretch until we saw him again. He's a liar. Wesley Riddle's not here. And it's because he's shamed. I think it's because he's shamed. Yeah, I, I think so too. We'll we'll leave it at that. <laughs> no, no further explanation needed. I mean he's he's just ashamed of uh of his performance last weekend in the picking competition. That's truly really what it is. I guess uh, let's get right to I'll, that. So last weekend I'll just yeah, let's just segue right into it. UFC two twenty was last weekend also. On top of UFC 220, we had Bell to 192, so it was a big weekend of fights. Just moving right along, our picks champion, I retained the belt. I went 10 and 6. I tied with you, Nicholas. You also went 10 and 6 over the over the combined efforts of both events. But since I had the belt beforehand, I keep the belt. Tie goes to the winner, as we all know. Uh, Wesley came up short with a 9 and 7 record in the picks contest. As far as our DraftKings team go, a really big effort in DraftKings. He put up together 572.5 points. He blew us away. I was second with 307 points. He beat me by almost 300 whole points. He had one, two, three, four, five performers who scored triple digits. The only person who didn't do well for him was Frankie Marbojosa, 37 points. But other than that, just a lights out performance. I think it might be the best performance we've ever seen from an individual DraftKings team as long as we've been doing this. If not the best, it's certainly right up there. Sensational showing from Wesley Riddle there. So he is your DraftKings champion now. I still have the picks belt. And looky here, I still have the performance belt. That's right. I went into last week with three belts. I kept two of them. I nailed performance of the night bonus with Daniel Cormier and I nailed my underdog pick of the week I had Dustin Ortiz he came through West Riddle also got two of them right but again I had the belt goes to the guy with the chance to retain he also nailed Daniel Cormier his underdog pick was Rob Font that hit Nikolai you only got one right but it might have been the most impressive one uh not for degree of difficulty but for impressive performance you picked uh Abdul Razak Al Hassan to get a performance of the night bonus and he did in sterling fashion your other picks Almeida Font as fight of the night came up short and Ganu obviously came up short and Bohoso your underdog pick of the week him up short and just for one final bit of bookkeeping just for the record your fight of the night last week our burgos your performances daniel Cormier, abdur zaka al hassan so none of us got fight of the night uh i got in one of the performance and one of the underdogs so i keep two of my belts and i'm coming back for the third this week so watch your ass we didn't go over bellator did we I, I we didn't go over specifics, but I, I tallied the Bellator totals into our picks. There was okay. no obviously bonus structure there. But if you would like to spe break that down specifically, as far as the UFC event went, very strong. And then the once the car kept moving in the UFC, I ended up doing fairly poorly. Of my six losses on the weekend, four came in the UFC card, the Davis, Almeida, Burgos, and uh, Ngannou. I had picked all of those. Wes had five losses on the UFC card. I'm sorry, is that five or is that that is it's five? It is correct five. He lost on Pantoja, Davis, Bohoso, Burgos, and Nganu. Nick, you did the best on the on the UFC card. No, you and me tied on the UFC card. You had Davis, Almeida, Bohoso, Burgos, and Nganu. Actually, no, I did the best on the UFC card with four. You did five on. You had five losses on the UFC card, so I won the UFC card. As far as the Bellator went. I went three and two on Bellator. I got both of the main event and co-main event wrong. I picked Diego Lima and Quentin Rampage Jackson. Both of them came up short. All three of us picked Rampage Jackson. Wes also picked um, uh, Corrales was going to walk to get, he picked uh, Karakanian to beat Corrales. That came up short. And Nick, you missed on Crutchin. 
a random pick for Crutching to beat Pico and a pick on Rampage. Is this right? Maybe I did win. How many you got? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Oh, I went straight up on the picks. I mistallied. You went nine and seven as well. Look at that. So that's great. I thought I was having to hold. So I won straight up on the picks. I keep my performance bonuses because I had the edge coming in and I lost the DraftKings title. But yeah, you also went nine and seven on picks. I missed how it apologies for that, but Very I'm feeling pretty good about myself. Fair enough. Um, okay. Bookkeeping in the books, right? We're done. Bookkeeping is in the books. We are ready to go. Perfect. Um, and just in case you didn't see my message, move your microphone a little closer. The people got to hear you. All right, UFC okay. on Fox 27 goes down live from Charlotte, North Carolina this Saturday night. And you, sir, you, Jed, will be there live. Lucky duck. I will, I will be there live. I'm uh I am leaving on Friday to go to go make the trek. It's not a very it's not a very big drive for me, so I'm a. Uh, uh I'm a I'm at Saturday. I'm just going up Saturday morning. I'm not doing the weigh-ins tomorrow because for a Fox car, this is one of the worst fox card as far as like getting people interested we're about to hit a real run of bad cards here from the ufc um and this is this is a weaker effort for a fox card which is kind of surprising you'd think with the ufc in a position renegotiating their deal they'd be wanting to put a better foot forward as far as their television marketability kind of gussy up their ratings as much as they can to get that big number but uh you know, outside of the main event, which is a rematch that most people probably don't even know is a rematch and that m a lot of people, most people probably don't even care about, it's a pretty, the card's pretty thin as far as name value goes, so I'm not going to the weigh-ins. Uh, I'm just going to show up on fight night, go watch some fights, interview some fighters, do my, do my duty, and then come home afterwards, but... I am excited. I always love to go to the events, um, and this is the first one. I believe I'm also going to be attending UFC Austin, so it's exciting to get to have so a couple of events pretty close together. I'll have fun with that. But you just a great city. How we're going through a stretch of these not so great UFC cards. I, I love how fighting is sending none other than Jed Mishu out to them. Hey, you know you got to make your bones somehow, and I'm okay with uh, with this being my way. It just so happens that the not great cards we're dealing with. Uh, happen to be sort of in a general location that it's easy for me to get to. So so I just the way the cookie crumbles. How far are you from Charlotte, like driving wise? Oh, three hours. Three hours. Are you spending the night? You said you're coming home right after, but yeah. I mean, uh, I'm pretty nocturnal. So if <laughs> I spend, like I am, so if I spend the night, I would just, like after the fights, I would just go kind of sit in a hotel room and not fall asleep until probably eight or nine in the morning. So I might just drive back, but uh, we'll see how I feel. Maybe I'm really tired after the fight nights, and I'll uh, just just go grab a hotel real quick. After, after a week long of work, or a week full of work, media day, weigh-ins, everything else. I'm not doing weigh-ins. I know. I'm not I doing know. weigh-ins, okay. so, it's, so it's easy. I'm hinting at the fact that you're you're taking the lazy way out. You're, you're just showing up for some fights, and that's about it. Hey, Pretty much. Smart. I'm okay yeah. with that. I am okay with that. Yeah. All right, so let's go through this card ufc and fox 27 kicks off on the fight pass early prelims at an early time of 4 p.m eastern 1 p.m pacific of course all these big fox cards are on uh, earlier in the day than we're used to lucky for us we have four fights kicking yeah on the uh on the fox main card and that starts at 8 p.m eastern that is fantastic we'll be done uh by 10 eastern and that's basically unheard of so I, I i always like fox cards for that reason so we kick things off in the featherweight division austin I, arnett I didn't taking... remember that i'm definitely coming home on saturday night i forgot oh, yeah, that that's this... actually a good point really yeah. i'll be on the road by there's no chance i'm going to a hotel room to be awake in it for eight hours so i'm definitely just coming back on saturday night <laughs> So we kick things off in the featherweight division. Two newcomers, Austin Arnett, who a lot of people remember from Dana White's Tuesday Night Contender Series. He had a great back-and-forth scrap with Brandon Davis, who made his debut last weekend in UFC 220, fell short against Kyle Bartniak in the final prelim on uh, FS1. So Austin Arnett has not fought since then, I don't think, unless I'm totally wrong. But I don't think he has. So he, he's actually coming into the UFC off a loss, which is interesting. But it was a fun fight, so sort of understandable. He's taking on Corey Sandhagen, who is coming off a great win at LFA just a week or so back. Uh, Jed, I know... Eight days. Eight 
days is a turnaround for Sandhagen here. Very, very quick turnaround. And you are correct, Sand, uh, Arnett's coming in off the loss, but it makes sense when you consider this fight is going to be awesome. Nobody's going to know. Nobody's going to care about either the guys in this fight card or what's happening here. But both of them are really good action fighters. And if you saw Arnett's uh, fight in the Dana White Tuesday Night Contender Series, it was a super exciting fight with Davis. I expect the exact same thing here. Um, I, you know, my only concern really is that Sandhagen is coming in with such a quick turnaround. Uh, that can that can be a bit of a bad thing, you know. Um, Michael Bisping talked. I mean, there are a lot of reasons Michael Bisping lost to Kelvin Gastelum in Shanghai, but he also spoke about how it's kind of hard to be that kind of ready to go when you train for a fight camp and then the fight happens and then the turnaround that quickly kind of that is a concern here for me with Sandhagen but beyond that I think Sandhagen this is a fight that he should win uh I think he's just a better striker he's more versatile he throws at a higher pace with more volume um if you watch Arnett fight he looks like a guy who watched Conor McGregor fight and then decided he wanted to get into it and kind of his game resembles a lot of the movement Conor McGregor has without the really elite finishing skills maybe he develops those later Sandhagen has a lot more depth to his game, and I just think a lot of more skills. So I like Sandhagen to outpoint Arnett here over a really fun 15 minutes, assuming that that quick turnaround doesn't kind of weigh him down. Pretty much with you on all of these, uh, on all of your points in this one. Um, it should be an interesting fight, should be pretty entertaining. Both guys are pretty well rounded. Arnett has both a, a number of knockout wins and submission wins, and even decisions under his belt. And same goes for Sandhagen. San Sandhagen, uh, not too many knockouts, so he seems to be a bit of a submission guy. Although, how did he finish his LFA fight? Remind me. Do you do you remember? Do you know? Wait, which one? Oh, we're talking about the one uh, the, like seven days ago or whatever. The yeah. one, the one seven days ago. Uh, it was like an instant KO. Okay. Yeah. I, I guess that makes sense because if yeah, so it is one oh seven round one of three TKO win over Jose Aguayo LFA thirty one. Uh, last weekend so that makes sense it was a quick win um so I, I just said he doesn't have too many knockouts under his belt although he's coming too straight uh into this one he's on a two-fight winning streak um i'm gonna go Corey sandhagen um odds makers agree so that makes me all the more confident when you have two newcomers and one, one guy's over two and a half uh or two to one underdog or favorite i mean I kind of got to uh, agree with that and pick him. So give me Corey, Hand uh, Corey Sandhagen by decision in this one in a pretty entertaining and somewhat competitive bout. We go That's to exciting because our colleague Wes Riddle has sent in his picks for this week, and he is taking the underdog. He is taking Austin Arnett. So we already have dissension immediately into the show. That's that's promising. Although now that now that I just said that, I'm sure uh, Wes and I will agree on every single other fight. <laughs> I don't know. Wes has got some underdog picks, so we'll see how it shakes. So out. do I. So do I. We move to the welterweight division. Nico, the hybrid price, taking on the returning George, the silencer Sullivan. If anybody isn't aware, George Sullivan is coming off, I believe, not just one but two. You back to back. You saw the suspensions. Um, I'm pretty sure that is the case. I do not you think I'm wrong. Are, uh, I th I'm not entirely sure you're right. I think it might be the same suspension that ended up with like the same issue. I don't know that he failed two drug tests. I, I it might just be all stemming nope. from the same issue. January 26, 2017, almost a year ago it today. It is a year ago tomorrow. MMAfighting.com headline, George Sullivan, hold on, some random tab open. George Sullivan fails drug test facing second UFC anti-doping violation. Okay. Uh, all so I remember more into this. All um, I remember is that he says he was on a fertility drug because he was trying, he and his wife were trying to have a child and that somehow the labels were. I do remember that. Yeah. Incorrectly. Or but he, this was he, a second he claims that the drug labels test. Were he he tested positive test. for. X substance, I do not know what it is at the time, while on another suspension. Mm, so, yeah, uh, bravo, uh, George Sullivan, uh, but welcome back. Impressive stuff. I just remember him putting it off on a fertility drug, and there seeming to be some validity to that claim, which would make sense if it was his set. If he tested, if he popped while on suspension, and they only gave him another year on top, it makes sense that he maybe has some some kind of grounds there. 
Um, as far as this fight goes, that that layoff gives me a lot of trepidation here. Uh, I don't love Nico Price's game, frankly. He is he looks so clunky on the feet, really jilted and stuff. But he he hits pretty hard, um, and has he seems fairly well built. Like he seems to have an aptitude for fighting, but there's something about him that I'm just not hold on yet and i think sullivan does a lot of things that could be good he's aggressive he works a high pace um but he just the the year like the two year long layoff is very disconcerting for me and he's been a bad defensive wrestler and nico price can can work takedown so i think all those factors together make me think nico price is probably going to get it done with a combination of sort of his weird but effective striking game um, and the fact that when things go awry for him on the feet, he can just take Sullivan down and kind of work a grinding game on top. So give me Nico Sullivan by decision, or Nico, sorry, Sullivan. Nico Price. Yeah, give me Nico okay. Price by decision. And our colleague Wes Riddle agrees he has Nico Price with a second round TKO. I like Nico Price here, so no dissension in this one, and maybe just a hint of what's to come. Hopefully not. Uh, and I am quite confident in Nico Price in this one. The layoff of George Sullivan certainly concerns me. Coming off again to Usada suspensions, not the best uh, thing to be coming off of coming into a return fight. Uh, and just stylistically, this isn't a very good matchup for him. Uh, Sullivan, if we're being honest, he's not the best fighter. He hasn't won since uh, 2015 when he grinded out Dominic Waters. Of course, a lot of that is due to the fact that he's coming off a big layoff, but um, Nico Price on the other end, he is kind of clunky on the feet, as you said, but he hits really hard, and at the end of the day, he can put uh, he, he can put his strikes together and land, and that's really all he needs to do against George Sullivan. Uh, Sullivan is coming off a knockout loss himself. He was knocked up by Alexander Yakovlev, who is not really known for his striking power or ability, and so Sort of my thoughts are that if Yakov Lev can knock him out, so can the hybrid. So give me Nico Price by knockout in the second round. And the reason I'm going second round is simply because Price isn't the quickest guy. He needs a little time to warm up. And so I'm going Nico Price by knockout in round number two. We move on to the sixth fight FS1 prelim card. It kicks off at 5 p.m. Eastern, 2 p.m. Pacific in the lightweight division. We have Vince Pichel taking on Joaquim Silva. Pretty fun one at 155 pounds. Jed, do you like Pichel? From Hell Pichel, I should say. Got to add in the nickname. Or Neto BJJ. I'm taking Vince Pichel here. I don't feel super confident in it. Um, The odds reflect how close this fight is. It's a pick em at virtually everywhere, which is rare. Usually at least one book has a favorite here. But basically everyone sees this fight as deadlocked even. Um, and I think there's a good reason why here. Uh, Joakim Silva... He has big power, and uh, uh, I think he's a BJJ black belt. Not a hundred percent on that. It looks like I have BJJ black belt written in my notes. And his um, name is Neto BJJ. That's true. Uh, so I would assume that this is accurate as well. Um, he's decently well rounded guy. He mixes his attacks okay. Like he's a very competent fighter. Um, his one area that I think is probably most lacking is his takedown defense, uh, and I th that's why I'm taking Pichel here. Um, it's possible that Neto BJJ works him, uh, just kind of outworks him on the feet with striking. Michelle is not a huge volume guy really on the feet, but he lands a lot of takedowns. He can control a fight, uh, and I think he's probably competent enough to avoid any type of sweep or submit game from Neto BJJ off his back. So I don't feel super confident, but I am going to just favor the wrestling of Vince Michelle here. And our boy Wesley Riddle uh, sort of agrees. He also is going with Michelle, but he's feeling more confident. He has Michelle with a second round TKO as well. Very interesting. Um, I'm actually going to go on the other side. I am on the island all by myself. I'm going Yo Queen Silva in this one. I think the odds are bang on. Um, like this is a super close fight. Minus 110 on both sides makes a ton of sense. And I could be wrong. You guys could be wrong. Like this is a really, really tough one to call. I think this is a, will actually be a pretty fun fight if it's on the feet. Uh, the way I look at this one, I actually think Silva has more ways to win. I think he actually had the potential of taking Pachel down. Um, his jiu-jitsu is not too bad. We don't see a ton of it, but I think we saw a little bit of it when he fought uh, Reza Madadi because he, he started getting on top of Madadi in his last one. And uh, But I think this will mostly be contested on the feet. I think Silva might have the edge there. Um, I know Pachel is... 
seems to have the veteran savvy, although their records are dead even. So it, it, I don't know if that really makes sense saying it, but he, he's been around a bit longer. And I think that might count for something. They're both 10 and one for what it's worth. Michelle would have a, a better, a different record, a, a more experienced record if, because uh, he, in his last fight, he was coming off a super long layoff. He had fought since uh, 2014. And so both guys are, are decent strikers. Um, both guys are dangerous. I mean, it, to me, this almost comes down to who lands first. I'm going to say Silva does. I'm going to go Joaquim Silva by, I'll go a third round TKO. Um, Although I think this is close enough where it could go the judges uh, as well, but I'll, I'll go Silva to mix it up a little bit by third round TKO. You know what's exciting about that pick, Nick? Yes. What? You you chose a man to take down. You said I think he can take down uh, Vince Bichel. Joaquim Silva is 0 for one. He has attempted exactly one takedown in the UFC, and it was stuffed. You know what? Maybe I'm thinking of uh, maybe Madadi was taking Silva down. Well, Madadi was taking him down. He landed like eight in that fight. <laughs> mm, all right, that might change something. I, I <laughs> believe Silva did. I, I believe Silva did end up with a sweep uh, in one of the rounds, though, and ended up okay, on top well, of Madadi. It, so. It's always great when you get two fighters mixed up and uh, pick a fight. Um, I'm, I'm going to stick with Silva. Uh, forget any sort of wrestling <laughs> from Silva. Like, totally <laughs> pretend I didn't say that. He's not taking Vince Michelle down. Um, but uh, I still like him to edge him out on the feet. Uh, again, I'll say third round TKO. I have a hard one, uh, ha- hard time seeing this go to the distance. Although, you never know. So, Silva by third round TKO. I'll stick with it. Just no wrestling. Uh, we move on to the flyweight division, the women's flyweight division, that is. Justine Kish taking on Ji Yon Kim. Jed, do you like Kish? Or Kim? I mean, this is a setup one for Justine Kish here. You check the odds out, uh, and she is one of the bigger favorites on the card. Um, I think she's third or fourth biggest favorite here. Um, I'm behind only the Gregor Gillespie and the uh, Mursad Bektich, who are both enormous favorites. We'll get to them later. Um, this is a setup one for Justine Kish, who is a very competent fighter, Um maybe not as good as you sort of think she should be. She's got this big, impressive uh, Muay Thai, like world championship record uh, in her back pocket, but seems to be sort of a bad striker. Very good in the clinch phase, but not super great at range, but seems to have skills in kind of most phases. Um, And she's taking on uh, Jian Kim, who's the best thing you can say about her is that she is fairly large for the division. She's 5'7". She's going to have a two inch height advantage and like a, a, almost 10 inch reach advantage i think which is like that's that's pretty substantive um so if if of uh, if Gion kim can kind of stick on the outside and maybe take advantage of that reach some you know like i said for all her accolades kish is not a great distance you know range striker but i just think kish is going to be able to work her way in the clinch kind of work her over here work trips and takedowns if she wants and just kind of have her way this is a setup for her to win i think she's going to win um, and kind of announce herself now as a flyweight maybe to watch in a division where a couple of wins could put you in title contention because it's so new and so much is happening. Well, agrees he has Kish with the UD. Yeah, I, I think this is a, a mostly a straightforward win for Justine Kish. Um, I don't think super highly of Kish. I mean, she can do everything okay. Um, I think she'll mostly grapple en route to a victory over Kim here. Um yeah, I mean, she hasn't been super active in her UFC career. I know she made her debut against Ansaroff. Had a, had almost a year layoff after that. Uh, had about a six month layoff after, after that. She, another six month layoff. So, I mean, dating. So she made her debut January 2016. This is only her fourth fight inside the octagon. Um, but as you said, she has the physical advantages here, so that will certainly help. Um. Oh no! It is. She also has a Kim. home field advantage too. Yeah, Kim is the bigger fighter, but yes. Justine Kish it does have the home field advantage. She went to school in Charlotte, like North Carolina. I think she grew up in North Carolina, so theoretically was, could get some. Was of that Kish home really field. born in Russia? I have no idea. Apparently Wouldn't surprise me. I have no idea. I just thought didn't think so, but anyways, I, I like Kish. I, I think she'll be able to uh, grapple Kim on route to a victory. Uh, yeah, Kim, her her fight over Pudilova was relatively close, if I remember co- correctly. 
Um, although I probably don't remember too well because that was the overnight card that I know I watched um, just how closely that's I'm not sure man it might have been asleep no you know what I actually skipped that one I woke up two fights later so I, I didn't actually see it so I, I I don't know if Kim looked good but she lost so that's really that all that counts um yeah I don't have much to say on this one Kish is a favorite she'll get the win UD that, that's my pick we go to the women's featherweight uh, strawweight division. If we were going to the featherweight division, that'd probably be Chris Cyborg, and that'd be a lot later in the show. Uh, we go to number 11, Randa, Quiet Storm, Marcos taking on Juliana Lima. We've got Iraq slash Canada taking on Brazil. Jed, who do you like? I'm taking my first upset, upset of the card. Uh, I'm taking Juliana Lima. I think this is a really close fight. It's basically a coin flip. If you're going to take Randa Marcos, I don't think that's a wrong pick. I'm taking Lima uh, for one reason and one reason only. Randa Marcos is still very bad at defending takedowns, which is kind of surprising because she sort of has at least the reputation of maybe being a wrestler more so than anything. The way she kind of came through the tough house, she was very grappling dependent, but she is not a great defensive wrestler. Um, and in this fight, I think she would be better served to strike. I know Juliana Lima has some level of credentials in kickboxing, or people seem – she's sort of uh, – I think Phil McKenzie, your colleague at Bloody Elbow, once called her Chick Congo, where she has the uh, the illusion of being a kickboxer, but really she does her best by working inside a clinch, kind of working clinch, clinch knees, takedowns, and, and top control. And I just think she can do that against Random Marcos here. On the feet – I think she can keep it competitive. Marcos is going to outwork her if this stays on the feet the whole time. Marcos is just going to land more strikes. She works at a higher pace. But I don't even love Rana Marcos' striking. It, it gets the job done, but it's not. I, I think Lima is a cleaner striker when she does choose to throw. So I think she can stay competitive on the feet. I think she can work takedowns on Marcos. Um, you know, anything can happen. I don't feel super confident on this because Marcos could also maybe work takedowns on her. And on in top position, Marcos is fairly good. But I box is in one side of the column for me than the other. So give me Juliana Lima with the upset win here. And we have dissension. Wesley Riddle is taking Randa Marcos by unanimous decision. So it's up for you to to decide here, Nick, who's right, who's wrong. Oh, it's a tough one. Um, Lima is very good on the ground, although she actually doesn't have a single submission victory under under her belt. She has decent jujitsu, but I guess she doesn't really get the finishes all too often. I don't think she has a single finish win in her UFC career, just for what that's worth. So if she, she does not. If she stops Marcos, that'd be quite impressive. I don't, I don't necessarily see that happening, uh, but it, it, it's a close one. Uh, Marcos should, I, I think Marcos should be able to neutralize a lot of Lima's ground offense by staying on top. I think on the feet, she's slightly better. I don't, I, I don't think uh, of too much of Lima on the feet. Although Marcos, as you said, I, I don't, I don't love her striking either. Um, so I, I think Marcos, though, has enough striking skill to be able to pick her apart mostly on the feet. So I'll go Quiet Storm here. I'll go Random Marcos for a, a pretty competitive decision win here. Although I was looking this earlier, and I don't mind Juliana Lima at plus money. So if you want to take a stab at her, I, I, don't, uh, I, I don't think that's necessarily, necessarily a bad bet. Ultimately, I don't think it'll win. But uh, at say plus one twenty or whatever Lima's at, it plus might be sixty plus one sixty. That you know, it, it might be worth a little bit sprinkle um, if you're leaning towards Lima. It's not I'm a bad for it. I'll tell you what else I'm for. Again, I'm for taking the over. Neither of these women have ever finished somebody in the UFC. There's almost point. no chance this doesn't go to the judges' yeah, scorecards. That's true. Um, Lima, for what it's worth, though, has only really lost to the best of the best. Uh, she lost to Joanna M. J. Check in her debut before Joanna's title reign. So take keep that in mind. She also lost to Carlos Barza, and she's coming off a submission win or loss to Tisha Torres. And so, Torres. Well, Olympia Sparza lost a split decision too. I don't think it was a split. Um, I have a vague recollection that it was a split decision. I barely no, remember as far as the first name. Random, Random Marcos beat Carlos Barza via split decision, didn't she? Yes, she did. She did. Although that was a bad she decision. Did. Yes, a bad decision. See, she, Random Marcos is also riding a three-fight losing streak. So I'm feeling good about the about the Lima pick. Interesting, interesting point. Um, I'm sticking with Random Marcos. I like her by decision, but I don't think this will be – all that fun to watch. 
We move it's, on again. No, it's, it's going to be terrible to watch. We go back to the women's flyweight division with Caitlin Chukagian taking on Mara Romero Borella. Who do you like here? Close one. I've been going back and forth on this. I've got my picks for all but three fights for this card already kind of researched and done on. Uh, maybe I might flip on some of them that are closer, but this one uh, is one of the few that I, I am still just kind of waffling, and I was hoping maybe – Maybe you would say something that would change your mind, or or uh, Wes. No, would don't don't jump. count on me to change your mind for this fight. Do you not? Are you not feeling confident either? Well, I, I mean, not really. <laughs> my 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 take on this fight really is: uh, can can Mar Romero, uh, Mar Romero Barella land the takedowns? Uh, if she can, I think she can win this fight. Chukagian is not a great takedown defender, but a very like a, she's a fine one, probably average, I would say. Um, Barella seems to have pretty decent top control. Um, she's working with ATT. It's a great camp, obviously. I think, for my money, it's the best camp in MMA right now. Um, so she's got great training partners. And her top position of ground control is fine. And at range, what she really can do is kick. It's not like she's a great volume thing, but she kind of kicks to navigate range. Um, and it's just whether she can land those takedowns or land enough of them to beat Chikagian. But Chikagian's pretty crafty with a sort of stick and move kind of striking style, which makes her harder for somebody like uh, Barella to maybe get her down. What are the ages here? Who's younger? Ooh, Chikagian's younger by two years. Um, just to do it, I think I'm going to take Barella here. I might end up changing that pick eventually, but at this moment in time, I, I'm still going to side with the grappler because Chukagian is a good but not great defender of takedowns. And we saw in her last fight uh, that as soon as Barella got Faria down, that fight was over very quickly. So if she can get her down, I think she can probably hold her down for the round. So then she only needs two of them to win the fight. And so give me give me another upset pick two in a row. Give me Mar Romero Barella. And once again, we're going to have dissension because Wes Riddle has Caitlin Chikagian via unanimous decision. All right. Uh, I am going to go with Caitlin Chikagian again, leaning Wes's side and you again are out on an island all by yourself. I uh, hear basically fairly straightforward fight. It's it's a close one, but I feel it's straightforward as far as if you're picking Romero Barella, she's getting the takedowns, maybe looking for submissions. Uh, and if you're going to Kagan, she's basically keeping Barella off of her and uh, striking en route to a victory. I think it'll be the latter. I think Caitlin Chugagan has, the, has what it takes to keep Romero Barella off of her. I think she'll use mix and kicks, mix in uh, her jab, other strikes to keep Rella off. And uh, I think Romero Rella could have a little bit of success on the feet, but it'll mostly be uh, one way traffic for Chukagan. No, I shouldn't say one way traffic because I don't think this would be a dominant performance. Uh, Chukagan is known to get into some pretty close fights. Uh, she's coming off a split decision win against Irene Aldana, for what it's worth. Um, I, I mean, Chukagian is not the best in the world, but she, I think, has the tools, what it takes to beat the Italian here. And so with that, I am going to say no more and pick Caitlin Chukagian by unanimous decision. We move to the featherweight division. Mursad Bektik returns after his huge come-from-behind loss, upset of the year contender loss to none other than the damaged Darren Elkins. He is taking on Godofredo Pepe. Pretty interesting one at 145 pounds. Bektik from Bosnia is, of course, a huge betting favorite here. Pepe, a huge underdog. Who'd you like here, Bektik or Pepe? I like Bektik. I think, uh, you know, we've had to kind of readjust our thoughts on Bektik after the Elkins comeback. I think a lot of that is really just Darren Elkins is one tough son of a bitch. Um, I'm, I am now a little bit concerned with the chin on Bektik because it shouldn't have taken it seemed like it didn't take a lot to put him in real danger um and so if God of Fredo Pepe is going to win here he's going to have to land a big strike a big knee a big something because he does not have a great takedown defense and Mursad Bektik is going to tune him up I mean Darren Elkins gr ground out a decision against him Mursad Bektik is going to take him down the same way Elkins did but beat the shit out of him in a way Elkins is not going to uh, I suspect this looks a lot closer to a Habib Nurmagomedov fight than a Darren Elkins fight. So I think Mershard Bektic is uh, 
I think that's just a speed bump, call it a prospect loss, whatever you want to with the Elkins loss. I think he's going to get right back on track here and announce himself as kind of the guy, I think, more so than any other featherweight. Um, I know we've got a lot of – I know um, dude's name that I can't think of right now. Ortega. I know Brian Ortega just kind of – came out of nowhere and submitted Cub Swanson and it uh, looks like he's he's probably going to get a title shot soon. But I think Mursad Bekdic is the better long-term prospect in the division. I think he's one of the best prospects in all of MMA. And I think he's just going to get right back on that horse and start m- marching his way up the rankings um, and just obliterate Godofredo Pepe real quick. And West Riddle agrees he has Mursad Bekdic with a second-round TKO. Have to complete the hat trick here. Uh, Merced Bektik, I think we'll get back on track in this one. I like that he's taking some time off. The Elkins loss was back in March at UFC 209, the card that was supposed to be Khabib Ferguson, of course. Uh, we all remember that what happened there, and that card will go down in history for being not a great card, but also for losing that fight. Um, on it, if you don't recall, Bektik dominated Elkins for the first two rounds, was, was doing well in the third round, and then was striking a little too much with Elkins after having great success on the ground, and he got knocked out with a kick and follow-up punches, and that was his undefeated record in the books. Uh, so I'm glad he took some time off. Recovering from a knockout loss, it's good. Um, I'm I'm happy he didn't get back uh, right in there right away. Um, I think this is one-way traffic for Merced Bektik. I like him a lot in this fight. I think he'll dominate uh, Godofredo Pepe. Pepe's not a bad fighter. He's just so wild, and I think this is actually a really good matchup for Bektik. Uh, he needs to watch out for Pepe's offense on the feet. He, I mean, he's not a great technical striker, but he just throws wild, and he could catch Bektik. Like, it's not out of the realm of possibilities that Pepe just throws a haymaker and knocks him out. That, that wouldn't, I mean, it surprised me. Absolutely. But it could happen. This is MMA. Anything could happen. And so that needs to be very smart in this fight. Um, and I think he'll, he, he will be smart. I think he'll be able to get Pepe down to the ground for the most part. Pepe does have some good submissions, so it's something to watch out for. But Bektik, we, we can't forget that Merced Bektik is a really good fighter. He is very, very talented. And definitely we have to consider Delkin's loss did happen. We can't just, like, get rid of that. But... I didn't learn tons in that fight, if I'm being completely honest. I know that he can get knocked out, so that's not a great thing. But he was dominating Elkins, and Elkins is on quite the tear himself. And so I don't think uh, there's too much uh, we should really pause for concern in this one. I don't think Pepe has much of a chance. So give me Merced Beck by second round, ground a pound TKO after Pepe starts to tire. So Bektik, TKO, round number two, book it. We move on to the final FS1 prelim. We have Eric Koch taking on Bobby Green. Interesting one at 155 pounds. Do you like New Breed or King? Both of these guys should be cut on principle. Like They're both good-ish lightweights or featherweights. I don't know, actually. I assume this is a lightweight belt. Lightweight, yep. Yeah, lightweight belt because of Bobby Green. Um, but like Bobby Green hasn't legitimately won a fight since like 2014. Um, 2013. Uh, I think his last one was a split decision over Josh Thompson, which I remember scoring for Thompson. Um, and then he's got three losses and a split draw with Lando Venata. Granted, that fight was fun as hell, but like Bobby Green has has not been performing well, and Eric Koch is just I don't even like I can't even tell you the last person he beat. Um, looking at it now, uh, it's just this is a fight between two guys who are going to try and find a way to shoot themselves in the foot. And for my money, I think it's more likely that uh, Bobby Green doesn't shoot himself in the foot. And that's his, that's a bold statement considering who Bobby Green is. But I think Bobby Green's a more talented striker than Eric Koch. Um, I don't think this fight goes to the ground really at all. I think this just stays on the feet. And I think Bobby Green, um, when he chooses to punch, is very good at punching. Um, he does a lot he'll forget about punching because sometimes he'll do that thing where he'll like slip punches like three or four in a row and then just kind of laugh and like point and try and make fun of you, but still never punch back and effectuate offense. So he's not actually doing anything and I hate it and I want to hit him. But then he does that and then Dustin Poirier knocks him out because he keeps doing it and Dustin Poirier just keeps trying to punch him and eventually punches him. 
Um, I just don't think Eric Koch is bringing the same artillery Dustin Poirier is. I think Bobby Green probably makes this fight way uglier and closer than it needs to be, but is just a more talented fighter than Eric Koch and, and gets a, I'll even say a split decision win here because he dicks around too much and lets Koch back into a fight he should have no business being in. And our boy Wesley Riddle agrees. he has, Well, sort of, he agrees he has Bobby Green with a unanimous decision. I'll go Bobby King Green here as well. Um which would mean he wins for the first time since July 2014 when he upset Josh Thompson at UFC on Fox 16, I believe that was. Robbie Lawler, Matt Brown in the main event. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I sort of plus one most of what you said in Wes's pick as well. Um, Green is the better striker, and as long as he doesn't crap the bed entirely, which he can do, we've seen it, uh, he, should, she, he should get past Eric Koch here. Um, Koch isn't the best striker, and he's you know j- just turning into not the greatest fighter if we're being completely honest uh he's coming off a loss to clay guida granted that wasn't on the feed guida just took him down repeatedly and, and and grinded him out completely different style matchup here uh coke isn't known to be a, a great striker anyways and so i think bobby green will will uh do do some good good things on the feet um but if we're thinking this is 3027 Bobby Green, I think we're probably wrong simply because Bobby Green is known to make fights closer than they are or than they should be. And so I like Bobby Green here. If he just he doesn't do what he should and Eric Coke wins, I can't say I'd be shocked, but Bobby Green should win here. So I got to go with that. Uh, I like Bobby Green here by unanimous decision. Again, a split, I mean, wouldn't shock me just because Eric Coke, he's not. Uh, I, I I feel like I'm making out Eric Koch to be a bad fighter. He's not a bad fighter. Uh, Green is just more talented and, it, for for what it's worth, a bit more well-rounded. Um, and so I like Bobby Green here. I like him by unanimous decision. We move on to the four-fight Fox card, which starts at 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific with lightweights. No, waltweights, actually. Drew Dober and Frank Macho is happening in the 170-pound division Frank Camacho missed weight in his last fight when he had a great fight against Demon Brown. And Drew Dober was fighting in the California, or he fought in California. Um, I think that might have been the 214 card. Could be wrong. But he fought in California in his last one. And he was one of the guys to be flagged. Not flagged, but it was recommended by the commission that he move up in weight. And so uh, with this happening in North Carolina, this has been moved up to the Waltweight division, although both guys, I think, seem to think they're better lightweights than Waltweight. But nonetheless, 170 pounds. Dobert, the Frank, the Crank, Camacho, Jed, close one. Could be for the night. Who do you like? I don't know about both guys. Uh, most of Camacho's career has been contested at Welterweight, uh, at least in his UFC run. Um, I know Dober has been a lightweight, I think, for almost the entirety of it. But... Uh, weight class um i have no idea what the fuck's gonna happen here just straight up uh i think i'm apparently really bad at picking drew dober fights i think i've picked incorrectly in most of his fights the last like four or five times out uh he seems to really be improving actively with elevation fight team since he got with them a little while back and so that makes this even more difficult here because if he hadn't been improving i think i'd take frank camacho and feel confident in it just he throws more offense. Um, he is a, maybe a more powerful, bigger guy. But I think Drew Dober's got a little more technique here, and so this is a really tough fight for me. I think this fight's a coin flip, um, realistically, and it's it's just it's hard for me to shake the fact, like the loss that Drew Dober lost to uh, you know Efrain Escudero not that long ago, like in a not not good every Escudero is not a good fighter anymore and frank camacho you know he had trouble with damian brown to an extent but other than that he's been fairly decent like i, I don't know man um wes is taking camacho by ud that sort of makes me want to go with frank camacho i've already picked two underdogs though so I'm going to take Drew Dober because he has seemed a lot better with Elevation Fight Team, and that's going to be the deciding factor. But I will not be surprised if Camacho is, is a bigger, more physical guy because he's a natural welterweight, and Dober is kind of just left left playing catch-up because he jumped up. 
Could be the case. Um, I'm going to side with Westbo here. I like Frank Camacho to get a unanimous decision win over Drew Dober. Uh, I've been pretty high on Dober. I think he's improving, as you said. I think he is turning into a somewhat talented fighter. Um, with this being at Waltzweight, it seems to favor Camacho. Um, do you mind checking their height and reach? Just because my screen did the fuzzy thing again, and I, I can't read it. Come on. Camacho has a three-inch reach advantage and a two-inch height okay, advantage. Okay, so he's clearly the bigger guy. I don't know how much that means. Dober is fairly aggressive and should be able to close that gap if that's what his game plan is, which it should be. Uh, Dober is going to be looking to get this to the ground a lot, um, but he's not a bad striker, and I think Camacho would be able to do enough to keep this on the feet. Um, and I think I favor Camacho a little bit on the feet. I think he's slightly more technical, maybe a little more powerful, although Dober – I mean, Dober – he seen, let, let's not forget that, he, sure, he knocked out Josh Berkman, but Josh Berkman is Josh Berkman. And so I don't know how much you put into that and if you call Drew Dober a knockout artist afterwards. Um, maybe you do. Maybe you'll prove me wrong and knock out Camacho. Who knows? Um, but I'm going Frank Camacho. I like him to get the job done. I think he's good in firefights. I think he'll be able to turn this into one. Drew Dober is not the not super known for fight and night performances. I think he might be sucked into one. And I think that's sort of where Camacho thrives and he'll be able to take advantage of Dober in that uh, spot. And so I do like Frank Camacho here with the unanimous decision. And that's my pick. We move to the 155 or stay. I guess, yeah, we are moving to the lightweight division. We've got Jordan Rinaldi taking on fairly top prospect, Gregor Gillespie. Uh, Gregor Gillespie is a huge favorite here. Rinaldi, a big underdog. Do you agree with the odds, or are you going to pick against the rising star in Gregor Gillespie? Come on now, you know the answer to this. <laughs> I have been I've been preaching to y'all about Gregor Gillespie since I got on this show, and y'all tried to tell me that uh, Andrew Holbrook was going to defeat him, and and I was just like, you guys are freaking insane. Um, I am enormously high on Gregor Gillespie. Realistically, the only thing that keeps Gregor Gillespie kind of from being a truly great prospect is the fact that he is already old. Um, and by old, I mean he's 31. <laughs> like he's, he, he got into the game late, but this is a guy who is an elite level wrestler. Like he, the only reason he is not currently competing, wrestling for the United States of America on the international stage is that. He competes in the same weight division as like one of the deepest weight divisions in the sport, particularly in the United States of America. And he sits behind; he would sit behind Jordan Burroughs basically forever. So he had to just kind of give up the the wrestling career um, to to make the move into MMA. And he has been outstanding every step of the way in MMA. Undefeated hasn't even really been in a fight that you could consider close. His uh. He has just beaten the hell out of people. He looks better every single day in, and I am super high on him. This is not a knock on Jordan Rinaldi at all, who I think is uh, a, actually a pretty good fighter, like legitimately a fairly strong fighter. But there are levels to shit, this shit, as Daniel Cormier says, and uh, Gregor Gillespie is a whole different level. I don't think Rinaldi can stop the takedowns of Gillespie, and I don't know that he can kind of hang with the power Gillespie brings on the feet either. Uh, I love Jordan Rinaldi's fight name. I think Jordan All Day Rinaldi is an awesome nickname, but he is not going to go all day. He's probably going to go about eight minutes before he gets stopped with some violent shit. Give me Gregor Gillespie in a big, big way. And Wes Riddle has Gillespie with a second round TKO as well. All right. Um, I'm going to complete the hat trick and go with Greg Gle Gregor Gillespie. Uh, not very surprising here. He is one of the bigger favorites, if not the biggest favorite on the card, for good reason. Jordan Rinaldi is coming off a very good submission win. He got that, uh, oh, geez, blanking, uh, the Von Flew choke, one of the only Von Flew chokes in, in UFC history, of course. The other few are, are mostly held by OSP. Um, but I think they're, they're so, I mean, in my opinion, Gregor Gillespie is on a different level than Jordan Rinaldi. Uh, Rinaldi is coming off a sub win. He's not bad on the ground, but, I mean, once Gillespie gets on top, it's sort of game over, in my opinion. I don't see Rinaldi doing really anything off his back. Um, and then on the feet, I think Gillespie is better as well. So I don't know really how Jordan Rinaldi wins this one. Uh, give me Gregor Gillespie by Tukio Ground and Pound in round number one. 
We move on to one of the closer fights in, in, in the uh, UFC card. It's the coming event. Featherweight's Dennis, the menace, Bermudez, taking on Andre Touchy Feely. We got, I believe that's number 12, right? Bermudez is number 12, or is that number 4? I have no idea what the rankings are. No Doesn't clue. really matter. The rankings don't care or don't matter. Anyways, Dennis Bermudez taking on Andre Feely. Jed, are you going with the favorite here, Bermudez, or the underdog in Touchy Feely? Uh, I told you earlier that I was very conflicted about a couple of fights. This is the last one of the fights that I don't have a great read on yet. I haven't done all of my tape study for this one uh, yet either, which is kind of factors into my decision here. On paper, I sort of just looked at it and thought, Andre Feely seems to be improving a lot, and uh, Dennis Bermudez feels like he might be kind of past that peak of his career and sort of down on the downward side. Uh, he's lost two in a row, I believe. Um uh, got obliterated by Chan Sung Young, and I think he lost to Darren Elkins. Yes, he's lost to Darren Elkins after that. Um, so he hasn't won since a kind of whatever win over Hani Jason uh, in 2016. Um, but you know, if you look at if you look at Dennis Bermudez's career uh, in the UFC and just career in general, oh look at that! Dennis Bermudez lost to Jordan Rinaldi on the regional circuit. I had no idea about that. Um, if you look at his career uh, in the UFC, for the most part, he has just lost to the best guys. Um, Chen Sung Young, very a top featherweight. Darren Elkins, a top featherweight. Jeremy Stevens, a top featherweight. Ricardo Lamas, a top featherweight. Like those are his losses, and he even has a win over Max Holloway. That was a bad win. He should have lost to Max Holloway. So, you know, the guys he's losing to are elite level featherweights. Is Andre Feely there? I don't think Andre Feely's there at this point. I'm not willing to call him an elite level featherweight, but I think he has the tools to get there and he's sort of underachieved for a while. But I was fairly impressed by the strategy, the, the, the discipline uh, we saw in the Artem Lobov fight, because that has always been a big problem with Feely is he's been an undisciplined fighter. And against Lobov, he, he kind of matured a little bit in the cage. He's gotten enough cage time to figure these things out. He's going to bring some physical advantages here. He is five or six inches taller. He's got uh, what looks to be an eight-inch reach advantage here. Um, he's a younger guy. I think uh, the only other question here for me really is uh, Bermudez's pace. I think he pushes a little bit higher of a pace So and the takedown game. like I really – if. If Feely's going to win this, I want to see him come out and use a more disciplined approach. Because if he does, I think he can win this fight. I think Dennis Bermudez is a guy you can exploit in those ways. If he stays using his physical tools, stays outside, ki keeps this a kickboxing match where he can use his length, uh, I think that that behooves him. But if Bermudez can kind of pace him down and then work takedowns, Feely's still not a great defensive wrestler despite training at Team Alpha Male. Um, so... I'm taking Andre Feely here just because of his physical advantages because he's younger because I think Dennis Bermudez might be starting an actual like drop off here. And things might finally be clicking as if this is me just kind of wishful thinking because I want Feely to be better than he is and he's just one of those guys who never gets to the plateaus you think he the, to the kind of states he should be in his career. Um, so I'm taking Andre Feely with a, a fun decision. But I will not be surprised at all if Bermudez just gets two takedowns, grinds him out, and gets a win. And our boy Wes Riddle also agrees with me. So we've got two people on the underdog so far. Is it a clean sweep for the underdog, Nick? It is not. Count on me to, to go with minus money. Um, this is a really tough one. I definitely feel you with this being a, a close fight and – uh, it really could go either way. Um, I like Andre Feely, what he brings on the feed in this matchup. Uh, I like the physical aspect of uh, of him as a fighter against Bermudez. I mean, having that inch, uh, or that big reach advantage, height advantage will certainly help him on the feed here. But I think Bermudez will be able to get it to the ground. Uh, I think he'll be able to use his wrestling a lot more in this one. Um, I don't know. It, 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 this is a weird one. Like my head, something in me is saying Feely just – just uh, outpoints him on the feet to either knock him out late or, or decisions him, but I still can't get it out of my uh, out of my mind that Bermuda should win this fight. He, I think he's the better fighter. Although Feely might be getting better, but Bermuda's, I think Bermuda's his best fights are behind him. But I don't necessarily think he's dropping off like entirely quite yet. I think we'll see the. Uh, 
soon enough, but maybe not quite yet. Um, and Feely, he always gets to these big fights, and then he just doesn't show up. Like, when after he beat Hawker and Diaz, I thought, okay, this is, like, Andre Feely is finally here. We've had a lot of high expectations for Touchy Feely. He has lost some fights. He's never gotten a huge winning streak going, and now he finally beat the top 15 guy. Now he'll finally be in the top 15 and, and keep going up. And then what did he do in his last fight? After a long layoff, after becoming a free agent, he lost to Calvin Cater. And now that Cater beat Shane Burgos, that doesn't look all that bad, but when when it happened, as a big favorite, wasn't the best loss to have on his record. Um, he followed that up with a win over Artem Lobov. To me, it doesn't mean a whole lot. I think Lobov is actually an okay fighter now. There was a time I thought he was the worst in the UFC. That doesn't seem to be the case. Uh, Chris Avila, when they fought, probably was. Um, I think Bermudez will just be able to use his uh, wrestling game. I think he'll be able to grind out Andre Feely here. Um, but man, uh, something in me is saying Andre Feely gets the biggest win of his career, but I'm going to stick with my head here and go Bermudez by unanimous decision. And that brings us to the main event of UFC on Fox 27 in Charlotte, North Ca Carolina. We got Ronaldo Jacques Ray Sosa, who, as I believe you said on the MMA circus earlier this week, who might just be the best, uh, one of the best fighters in the UFC who has never gotten a crack at UFC gold. Certainly one of the best middleweights who's never gotten a crack at UFC gold now that Yoel Romero has technically fought for the interim title and will do uh, will do so yet again uh, next month. We got Jacques Ray Souza taking on Derek Brunson, who has fallen short a couple times in the past couple of years, but he is seems to be on the rise yet again. Jacques Ray Brunson number two. Of course, we go back to strike force days. When I was a youngin and didn't watch MMA, Jacques Ray tapped him out with, I want to see a triangle. Am I right there? Um, I honestly have no idea. Well, they fought it. They, they fought before. Jacques Ray won. I believe he finished Brunson pretty quickly. No, first round no? KO. That's right. Okay, so I, right. I got he's, the first he's... round right. Just didn't get the uh, get the method. Um, uh, so Jacques Ray Brunson too. Brunson was still really bad. Does Brunson? get the biggest win of his UFC career? Does he get revenge on the Brazilian crocodile? Or does Jacques Ray Souza get back into the winning column? He gets revenge, and Jacques Ray Souza gets knocked out of knocked out both of his consciousness and of ever competing for a UFC title. He is going to go down as one of the very best, if not the best fighter to have never competed for a belt, and that is almost entirely as a result of Michael Bisping squashing the division for a year doing weird shit and so really it's a it's conor mcgregor's fault conor mcgregor is terrible for the sport um but that's neither here nor there what is here uh is that jacques ray souza is old he is closing on 40 right damn quick uh i believe he is 38 years old at this point in time perhaps 39 even i'm not sure i think he's 38 um he is 38 years old and I think we're just seeing him not be there as much. I mean, middleweight's one of those divisions where you can be, if you're really skilled, like heavyweight, if you're really skilled, it doesn't matter that you're old and kind of falling off in your athleticism until you get to a very specific set of people. And so we saw Jacques Ray kind of beat an old-ass Vitor Belfort and the old-ass Tim Boach and Chris Camozzi, but uh, he just got thumped up by Robert Whitaker, who no shame in that. Bobby Knox is the best well the best middleweight on the planet, um, the champion and a great fighter. But I think Jacques Ray Souza has always been a plus athlete and in a sort of sneaky way relied more on that kind of plus athleticism than many of his competitors in the division did. Um Yoel Romero is always thought of as like this great athlete and he is he's frankly probably the best athlete we've ever seen in the sport of MMA. Um, but like Jacques Ray Sosa is also a great athlete, but he really used his athleticism a lot to work his takedown game, to have that explosion on the feet to get his knockouts and stuff. And as that started to drop off, we're seeing less volume from him, less offense. Uh, and if he's going to win this, he has to win it on the feet. Derek Brunson has never been taken down in the UFC despite having like the organization or something enormous. Um, and Jack Ray Sosa doesn't take a punch all that well and never really did take a punch that well, but as he's getting older, it's he's less able to. 
and whatever you want to talk about Derek Brunson, he can, in fact, hit the shit out of people. When he connects, it is hard. He, this man throws heat. And I think it's just, you just don't need to overthink this one too much. Uh, it, you know, Sosa can't take him down, and he doesn't take a punch well, and the other dude hits really hard. I think one plus one equals two here. The only concern I would really have about this would be that Brunson is a very unreliable fighter. Um, he seems to be getting more of a handle on it lately, but, you know, the Robert Whitaker fight, he was arguably beating Robert Whitaker for the first, like, two minutes of that bout until he started getting so, so outright reckless the way he was charging forward and just sticking his chin out there and hoping to get countered. And Jacques Ray has good power of his own and has a good counter uh, counter left hand of his own. So, you know, if Brunson does that again, if he re reverts to being wild ass Brunson, maybe he just goes out and gets bolted. But um, even if so, he still could, that might like, it's, it's a much less likely that Shakare bolts him than like Whitaker does that, that plan, even if Brunson fights the worst fight of his life, he could still just win this purely on the style matchup of him hitting really hard and being extremely tough to take down. So I'm taking what is, I believe my fourth underdog of the fight card. Uh, I'm taking Derek Brunson. I think he gets a first or second round KO here. And that's kind of the end of Jacare, the contender and maybe Brunson, a win puts Brunson kind of in the mix, maybe one fight away or maybe some Somebody gets injured and he jumps in, you know, he could jump in at Perth if one of the two guys in that main event gets injured and he comes out of this looking clean. All right. Uh, so, and Wes, Wesley Riddle agrees. He has a second round TKO for Brunson. So are all three of us on the underdog here? We are. We weren't in the Kuman event, but we are now. And just for what it's worth, before I get into my quick preview of this fight, uh, the first round submission for Jacques Reed that was that I was thinking of that ended up having a rematch was Jacques Ray versus Musasi number one. I believe that was a very quick submission win for Jacques Ray way back in, uh, in the olden days as a 17 year old might uh, call them. Uh, in this fight, I laid Derek Brunson to knock out Jacques Ray in the very first round as well. Um, basically here, I look at Jacques Ray and he is 38, 39, right around there. He's getting up there in age. He is past his prime. He's coming off a knock knockout loss to Robert Whitaker. And it's not that there's shame in losing to Whitaker in 2017. Whitaker proved himself last year to be the best middleweight on the planet, uh, almost guaranteed. I know you might differ with Rockhold, as, as we talked about. But nonetheless, Whitaker probably is the best middleweight on the planet. And so losing to him isn't, isn't a bad loss. But getting knocked out for the first time in quite a while – at the age Jacare is, uh, it sort of symbolizes the beginning of a decline, and that's ultimately what I think continues here. Um, Derek Brunson hits really hard. Derek Brunson is wild, or can be wild. He's gotten better with, with, with his technique on the feet and not going absolutely crazy like he did back in uh, the end of 2016 when he fought Whitaker and got knocked out by Whitaker himself. But uh, he uh, really shouldn't matter. He still has the striking advantage. He hits harder than Jacques Ray. Uh, he's going to be looking for the for the knockout here, and I think he'll get it. Uh, Jacques Ray, of course, will be looking to take Brunson down and, and go for submissions. I mean, he's one of the best jiu-jitsu artists in the sport of MMA. I truly believe so. And I, I think that's still the case um, as you get older, it, 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 you know, less and less. But he, he is still so fantastic on the ground. So if Brunson, as you said, goes out there completely wild, I, I mean, I think there's a good chance. No, I mean, Jacare might bolt him, as you said, and just knock him out like he did last time. But I think more than likely he'll he'll get a takedown. He'll he'll catch Brunson coming in and get on top and maybe even submit him. And so I'm not super confident in Brunson. Um, he's an underdog for for a reason. I think in general, Jacare is the more proven fighter. But uh, but you know, I, I think if you're looking to bet this, an under bet wouldn't be that the you know, wouldn't be a, a bad bet. I know it's super pricey. It's like minus 400. But if you put a lot on that, I mean, there is no, to me, I would be outright very shocked if this goes five rounds. There is literally no way this is going five rounds, whether Jacques submits him or Brunson, uh, Brunson KOs him. And so that, that's a bet I might look at, uh, or, or I, I'm, I'm advising people to look at. I'm, I'm, I'm myself underage. I'm not going to uh, bet it. 
Uh, but I like Brunson here. I like him inside the distance. I like him by knockout in round number one. Jacare, I don't like his chin anymore. I think it could be gone. And Brunson hits hard. So I don't think this is a very good style matchup for him. Brunson, keep in mind, he is, if you go back to Brunson 2014 and before, this guy was a wrestler. This guy was incredible. He was a very good wrestler. That is what his roots are. And he's just happened to develop great power and he's fallen in love with his hands. And that has worked out for the most part. And so a uh, bad matchup. I don't see Jockery taking Brunson down. Brunson has never been taken down in, in the UFC. And so Derek Brunson KO round number one. That is my pick. And that does it for UFC on Fox 27. Let us move on to our performance of the night and knock or fight our post fight bonuses. And our underdog pick of the week. Let us go to you, Jed. You can give yours and then Wes's. All right, I'll start with Wes's. Uh, Wes's his Wes Riddle's fight of the week, a uh, fight of the night this week, is Drew Dober versus Frank Camacho. Uh, his performances are Derek Brunson and Mursad Bektich, and his underdog pick of the week is Camacho. Now, for the record, Wes also has. Four total underdog picks, but he has chosen to back Camacho as the one he feels most confident in. Good for him. I, too, have four underdog picks this week. Maybe five if I decide to pull the trigger on Camacho like both of you guys did. You, you almost convinced me. I just can't can't quite feel it yet. But my underdog pick of the week is going to be Derek Brunson. I waffled between uh, him and Juliana Lima, but I am going to go Brunson. I just feel better about that. Um, my fight of the night, I'm going with the, the the opener, the card opener, Arnett Sandhagen. I think you're probably going to take the other one that I would have taken um, if I wasn't going to take the the uh, Sandhagen-Arnett fight. But Which is what? I've seen both these guys. Uh, I think it would be the Philly Bermuda, Philly Bermudez. Uh, that was the one I was thinking. And then I just decided, you know what, let's have some fun. Let's let's pull the trigger on a fight that I, I guarantee is going to be fireworks because it's so early in the night. It might get overshadowed and lose the fight of the night moniker. But I know that fight's going to be exciting 100%. Uh, and my performances, I'm also taking Derek Brunson, uh, and I'm taking Gregory Gillespie. You know, I, you know, I love gorgeous Gregory Gillespie, so I'm putting him on my bonus squad. Nick, what about you? Remind me, who did West go for fight of the night? Camacho. Okay, Camacho Dober. Um, all right. Uh, for my performances, I hate to do it, but I think I'm going your your way. Derek Brunson, and Gregory Gillespie makes the most sense to me. Um, just looking at the prelims, I mean, Merced Beck. What's that? That's what Wes almost did Bektich, but that's what Wes had. Right. Yeah. I mean, Bektic could get one. I feel like he'll his fight is going to go on a little bit longer than Gillespie's. Um, and I think Gillespie's win j- just, I mean, the first round aspect, it might be a little prettier. Bekti is a grinder after all. I mean, uh, so Gillespie in a way is too, but he's a fun fighter. Uh, and then also he's high on the card. And so other than that, all, all of these are pretty close fights or going to the judges, in my opinion. Uh, for fight of the night, I basically have am, am going through weighing the options for two, and um, it, it's not Bermuda's Feely for what it's worth. Um, I'm looking at either Dobrik Macho like Wes or Pichel Silva like uh, like nobody. Um, to be different, I might just go. <sighs> do I want to mix it up or do I want to give your it gut. to you? Trust your gut. Yeah. Hmm. The thing is, I mean, Pichel could grind out Silva. I'm picking Silva. I think it'll be fun. Let, let's give it to, to Pichel Silva. Let's, okay. let's do it. Um, although, Camacho, he's one and one in the UFC with two fight nights, so he might just like be the guy to get fight nights all the time, and so he might get it. But I'll go Pichel Silva to mix it up, up a little bit. And uh, for my underdog pick of the week, I, too, will go Derek Brunson. It's basically Brunson or Camacho. Uh, I, I'm pretty confident in both guys, actually. So I like that. Uh, both, you know, both guys have plus money, but uh, Brunson, I think, uh, will, makes a bit more sense to me. Um, That's fair. So that with that, let's go to our drafting team. Uh, you can go first, and then you can give Wes's. I, I believe he did give him uh, give one right, and uh, he did he did give a drafting team. I'll Wes and I have three. Wes and I have three crossover fighters. Uh, we. All three of us have, or both of us have, Bektich, Brunson, and Feely. So, uh, you know, 
two of those guys or one of those guys big money Mershad Bektish cost you ninety four hundred dollars um but like we all feel pretty confident Bektish is gonna w- get the win here um uh Brunson is underdog so Brunson's a little cheaper 7800 and Feely 7600 um both me and Wes are picking all three of those fighters so all of them it would make sense to have on our DraftKings teams Wes is going to complete his team with Arnett uh Pichel and Nico Price so uh, I don't have the uh, the the money on that right in front of me but that's the completion of his team my team instead I've got Gregor Gillespie 9500 dollars because I've already got two big underdogs so I can pay some money there and i add another underdog because like i said i think juliana lima is going to take down and control random marcos takedowns equal points i'm taking juliana lima to win the fight i'm taking her to get me some points and then i had eighty three hundred dollars left over that fit with uh with sand Hagen. i think that's going to be a fight of the night contender i think there's going to be a lot of strikes thrown over the course of 15 minutes and i think sand Hagen's going to get his hand raised so that's my squad i feel very good about my squad here um, and it's, it's up to you, Nicholas, bring us home. It is. Okay. So, uh, I am going to go with, uh, this is, this was actually pretty easy cause I am going with two underdogs that are quite cheap on drafting. So I'll start out with my underdogs, Derek Brunson and Frank Camacho. It, if you watch the show, watch those picks. I'm, I'm, I'm actually quite confident. So I like them at 7,800 and 7,300, uh, respectively. Then I go to my big favorite, which is Mercer Bechtick. And then Nico Price is also pretty pricey at one uh, at nine thousand. Price is pricey, get it? Ha ha. And then we round things out with uh, two sort of mediocre priced fighters in Corey Sandhagen and Joe Queen Silva. So okay. again, it's Bechtick, Brunson, Camacho, Price, Sandhagen, and Silva. All right. Well, we've got so all three of us have Bechtick, and all three of us have Brunson. Makes sense. Um, um, and then, then there's a fair amount of diversity after that. So this should be a good week in DraftKings. I'm going to kick the shit out of y'all, but it should be a good week. <laughs> Counting on Julian Lima, aren't you? I am. I think it's going to be a good time. All right. Well, that is it for episode 97 of Before the Battle. That is it for the UFC Charlotte edition of Before the Battle. Real quick, tomorrow night, Lorenz Larkin and Fernando Gonzalez in the Bellator 193 main event. Give me a name. Who's the pick? Larkin, the big favorite, probably. I mean, I'm taking Mark, and I would take him anyway. But Gonzalez blowing weight is a uh, out of catch weight, not uh, a 180 good pounds. Yeah. He, he he couldn't make 170, so they made it 180. He still can make it. That's, that's not a good sign. So yeah. I'm definitely taking uh taking Lorenz Larkin. Yes. Um, I, I think that's pretty easy. I, I'm on coverage duty for that wonderful show, so pretty excited about tomorrow night. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Larkin probably inside the distance. Although he's on two in the UFC or in Bellator, and uh, I picked them both times, so you never know. So that is it for episode True. 97 of Before the Battle. Thank you all for tuning in. We really do appreciate it. Give the video a thumbs up down there if you enjoyed it. If you hated it, I guess give us a thumbs down, but preferably thumbs up. It would be nice. Um, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. That's somewhere around down there. And any comments? Any suggestions, any feedback, any comments, any anything you want to say, the comments section down below is open and free to say whatever the hell you want. Um, thank you, Jed, as always. Wes, we will hopefully see you next week, but you never know. Uh, Jed, remind everybody where they can find you on social media and let them know where they can find your coverage of the great sport that is called Mixed Martial Arts. You can find me on social media on Twitter at Jed K. Mishu. Give me a follow over there. Um, I It's pretty pretty much where you can link to all the work I do in general. But all my work also can be found every day at MMAfighter.com. I take care of the morning report every morning at 8 a.m. This weekend, as we talked about, I'll be doing live coverage from UFC Charlotte, cage side, backstage interviews. I'm taking care of our live coverage for the Bellator event tomorrow night, obviously doing that at home not going to the event um and on uh saturday afternoon the mma fighting gambling column uh preview column for ufc charlotte should be up and then every monday you can check me and my colleague alexander lee we do a a feature called missed fist recapping the best unsung under the radar fights of the previous weekend so give that a give that a 
peep check that out we're really proud of the work we've been doing more stuff coming up the po uh, down the pipeline so keep it locked for all that and thanks nick i had fun even if westford was a coward who shouldn't have been a coward because he managed to steal one of my three belts i still have two of them but he did take one so good for him all right, you guys can find me on the Twitter at Nick Bolden MMA. You can find all of my mixed martial arts writing over at bloodyelbow.com. You can also find my other podcasts here on this YouTube channel, The MMA Circus and Beyond Combat. The MMA Circus I did with my guest co-host that week, or this week, I should say, this man right here. You know him quite well, Jed Mishu, uh, filling in for Andrew Lawrence, and that was episode 147. We talked a lot. We, we talked about a lot of things. Uh, we, we talked a little bit about Brunson Jacre, but we also recapped UFC 220, Bellator 192. We talked about the the chance that uh, Cyborg versus Nunes might happen, Dillashaw versus DJ. We talked about Jim Jacek being a 2-1 to one favorite against Rose Nama Yunus, and much more. So go check that out if you would like. We would really appreciate it. Uh, it is found on any podcast platform, Bloody Elbow, and this YouTube channel. SoundCloud as well, so pretty easy to find. Beyond Combat, exclusive to this YouTube channel. I did episode 7 last night with my guest, MMAmania.com contributor, Andrew Pearson. We talked all about smartphone addiction. Uh, he has an app coming out either at the end of this year or early next year, and he is uh, has a solution to the ongoing issue that is smartphone addiction. Really interesting conversation. I suggest anybody, even if you're addicted to a smartphone or not, uh, I think it would be a good listen. Of course, I'm biased because it is my podcast. But if, if you would like, go listen to that. I would certainly appreciate that. Um, that's pretty much it. Follow me on Twitter. Follow Jed on Twitter. Follow Wes on Twitter. I'll give him a plug anyways, even though he's not here because I'm a Canadian. I'm a nice person. Go follow him in at all that mma thank you all for watching we appreciate it for jed Mashu, my name is nick baldwin and enjoy the fights on saturday love you guys